Hello and welcome to Uncle Ted Talks. My name is Lord Hugh and today I'm going to talk about whether our dominant global culture is really just a death cult in disguise. In the popular imagination, death cults are usually groups like Marshall Applewhite's Heaven's Gate, Jim Jones's People's Temple, David Koresh's Branch Davidians, Joseph de Mumbro and Luke Jure's Order of the Solar Temple and the like. They are groups who adopt an initially hopeful or redemptive ideology that nonetheless, unfortunately, seems to end in disaster. The term drinking the Kool-Aid is of course a household expression now, used to refer to a person who believes in a possibly doomed or dangerous idea because they are told that it has potentially higher rewards often in the afterlife. As you'll no doubt remember, the term comes from the grisly end of Jim Jones's followers, who started off on a very positive, although apocalyptic, note in the US, but ended up in mass suicide in what Jones called revolutionary suicide in Guyana, prematurely for the predicted global apocalypse, as the time elapsed has shown. You might think of yourself as a reasonably normal, well-adjusted person who's educated, grounded, more or less enjoys their job, votes and pays taxes, and is skeptical about organized religion, or at least is not heavily vested in any religious beliefs. That means that you are mentally healthy, not easily manipulated, and not at all vulnerable to being sucked into a cult. The odd thing is, that when experts, when looking for the personality traits that made people vulnerable to being seduced or influenced by cults, they couldn't find anything in particular. Their conclusion now is that we are all potentially vulnerable to being sucked into a cult. Even you. In fact, what I'm going to argue is that you have already been sucked into a cult, even if you don't know it. Now, how does that relate to our dominant capitalist consumer culture, which is now pretty much the default culture all over the world? What I'm going to propose to you now is that our mainstream culture is in fact a prosperity-come-death cult, which will inevitably end up in disaster, not dissimilar from David Koresh's follows Marshall Applewhite's or even indeed Jim Jones's. My proposal to you is that whether you know it or not, we are all unwittingly members of of this death cult. Even if you don't agree with the mainstream cult's ideas, you will still probably suffer the same fate, because when the global prosperity cult reaches its Kool-Aid moment, it will take everyone else down with it, including you and me. That's a bold claim, and bold claims require hard evidence. So what do I have? First, here are a few expert definitions of what a cult is. A cult is an ideological organization held together by charismatic relationships and demanding total commitment. A cult is a systematic manipulation of psychological and social influence. Or a cult is shorthand for religion I don't like. If these attributes sound like all organized religions, that's no accident. Every prophet of every major religion can be considered a charismatic leader. In fact, the biggest joke in religious studies is that cult plus time equals religion. Our mainstream culture believes in a dangerous idea that industrial growth, human material wealth and prosperity can continue growing indefinitely. If it can't grow quantitatively because of resource limits, then it can still be decoupled from nature so that it will continue to grow qualitatively. Optimistic futurologists think that if we reach the limits to growth on Earth, then we can continue expanding our consumption emission footprint into space by becoming a multi-planet species. You may think that our mainstream culture can't be a death cult because it's not apocalyptic. In fact, it's hyper-rational and hyper-optimistic. One could argue that it has to be in order to keep going. Capitalism only really works if you have faith in the future. 
Now hold that thought because it implies that if people generally lose hope in the future, then the whole cultish enterprise collapses in nihilism. But we'll come back to that point. You might assume that the mark of a normal, mentally healthy person is that they are reasonably hopeful and optimistic about the future. Our scientists, global leaders, captains of industry, economists, social influencers, health professionals and thinkers all generally sound a note of cautious optimism about the future. Even the most alarmist books on the risks of global collapse or the climate emergency always end with a hopeful, happy chapter, the encouraging conclusion. Otherwise, the book is unpublishable. Sure, there are challenges ahead, but we can fix them. Human ingenuity has always triumphed in the past, and so it will in the future, etc., etc. Human ingenuity is our cult fetish. Human tech is now generally accepted as on par with supernatural magic or a mythical superpower in our common ideology. Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. All cults are really personality cults. At the heart of every cult, you find a charismatic founder slash leader. By my definition of cults, the Ford Motor Company was a cult founded by Henry Ford. The institutions and corporations founded by Carnegie, Mellon, Rockefeller, Cecil Rhodes, in fact, all commercial corporations fit the definition of a cult. So do whole countries, like the US, which was founded based on a set of ideas fostered by a series of charismatic leaders such as George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and many others. A corporation, non-profit, NGO, or even a socio-political movement is just a subcult within the dominant culture. Once you see that cults nest within each other as subcults, you realize that our culture is cults from top to bottom. Our society is all cults everywhere you look. If you think the idea of a commercial corporation being a cult is far-fetched, then consider how most employees have to live on a daily basis with the following distinctive qualities that experts identify with cults. One, behavioral and personality changes. Companies have employee handbooks. They have codes of conduct, corporate cultures, and require employees to act in an unnatural and specific ways, especially in front of customers and seniors. Two, loss of personal identity. The workplace encourages team loyalty, discourages personal idiosyncrasies, requires employees to fulfill roles, to adopt a corporate identity, and to accept ranks and labels applied to self and others. 3. Estrangement from family The average salaried employee in the US is away from their families for about 42.5 hours per week, and an additional 5.4 hours at the weekend. Employers increasingly try to put pressure on workers to work unpaid overtime, and the demands of work and work-related stress are taking a severe toll on family life and mental health. U.S. corporations tend to demand total commitment from employees, and although they often pay lip service to a work-life balance, the reality is that family should come a distant second, or you risk getting fired. Four, disinterest in society. According to the law in the U.S., corporate executives have a fiduciary duty exclusively to shareholders. And compromising corporate profits for the sake of environmental or wider social goals is actually illegal. According to Robert Hare, the world expert on psychopathy, corporations routinely qualify as psychopaths, according to the standard checklist. Community involvement is normally just fake PR. 5. Pronounced mental control and enslavement by cult leaders. The job of a first-line manager in any corporation is to control workers, which includes mind control and thought manipulation. If you have any doubt about insidious mind control in the workplace, then take a close look 
at the widely used and patented Agile and Scrum project management methodologies. Almost any personal management course is a course in various worker mind and behavioral control techniques. Corporations generally oppose critical thinking in their employees, especially about the corporation itself. Control by threat of expulsion is also standard cult practice, as is control through fear of being fired from a job. As much as is legally allowed, corporations also often penalize people for leaving, just like a cult. At least in the U.S., corporations often demand inappropriate loyalty to their leaders, which is also the signature of a cult. Here's what's dangerous about all this. I propose that a death cult goes through a seven-stage life cycle. First, the divine revelation stage. A charismatic leader gets disillusioned with the status quo of a culture or predicts that it's heading for destruction. Two, the ideological incubation stage. The leader forms a breakaway ideology and creates a countercultural narrative that runs contrary to the prevailing wisdom. The ideology is always some kind of salvation story. It's what Ernest Becker calls a collective immortality project, a causa sui or self-causing project. Three, the evangelizing and consolidation phase. The leader expounds their ideology and gradually gathers like-minded followers. There's a definite discontinuity between step three and four. If the cult reaches a critical mass, it breaks through to maturity. If not, it dissipates and dissolves. Make or break normally depends on external dynamics and serendipity. Four, the persecution stage. If the breakaway movement blossoms into maturity, it becomes a threat to the dominant culture, which then tries to suppress, oppose it, or draw its adherence back. Five, the heyday. If the cult is not successfully suppressed, it takes its place on the global stage as a dominant fixture and begins implementing its ideology. There's great optimism and a sense of purpose. Six, corruption phase. Reality bites. The original vision becomes incoherent. The collective starts to fragment. People become power-hungry, selfish, and egotistical. The old blame the young for being weak, self-obsessed, and degenerate. The young blame the old for being dinosaurs and not being woke enough. Scapegoating, witch hunts, and sacrificing of innocent victims starts. Authoritarians begin to flex their muscles and walls go up. Communications start to break down. The threat of violence is everywhere. Fear is rampant. People can sense the four horsemen approaching. Splinter cults start forming as the rats leave the ship. 7. The Destruction Phase The Immortality Project was designed to defeat death, but ironically, it always has the seeds of its own destruction built into its very core. When the cult followers realize this great truth, they usually lose all hope and fall into dismal nihilism. What usually follows is anger and spite against the universe. The cult members then usually do some version of a cosmic table flip. They rage quit life itself and try to destroy as much of the universe as they can on their way out. Curtain falls. What should we do about it? Cults, culture, and cultish behavior are just too strong for humans to resist. So what I propose is starting a new kind of cult. A cult whose only aim is to draw people in, to brainwash them out of their cultish tendencies. The idea is to break the perpetual life cycle of cults spawning cults that has plagued humanity since the dawn of civilization. This new kind of cult is designed to end all cults once and for all, without itself falling prey to being just another run-of-the-mill self-destructive cult, like our global industrial civilization. The noblest of all ideals is to end noble ideals. But we'll have to be quick because our dominant earth-consuming cult is clearly in the corruption phase and barreling headlong towards the destruction phase. So welcome to the Extinctionati.
<laughs> Thank you for your time and attention. If you're curious and would like to know more, visit our website at Sirius.Institute. But remember, curiosity killed the cult. And please don't forget the tip jar. Even enlightened beings need to eat.